Welcome to today's webinar, Foundations for Extremes. My name is Luke Carruthers with Civil and Structural Engineer Media. Thank you for joining this webinar, which is sponsored by Chance. Before we begin today's presentation, first some general information about the webinar and the GoToWebinar platform. The views of the speakers and organizations participating in this webinar are their own and do not necessarily reflect those of Civil and Structural Engineer Media or its publisher's Y group. If you have any technical difficulties while viewing this webinar, please submit questions or a brief explanation of your technical problem using the question tab on the GoToWebinar control panel and a representative will assist you. During the webinar, you can also submit questions to our speakers using the same question tab. Submit your questions at any time and we will try to answer as many as we can later in the webinar. Zwei Group encourages group learning for our events. If you're viewing the live webinar with a group on one registered person's computer, that person must complete and submit the multiple viewer registration form in order for everyone to earn credit. Download the multiple viewer registration form from the handouts tab on the control panel. Submission instructions are on the form. Viewers of archive webcasts must pass a quiz in order to download a certificate of completion. Gary Sider will begin our presentation. Okay, Luke, I wanna show my screen here. Let's see, get the right one. There we go. So can everybody see my screen? Is it up and running? Looks I good, so. Gary. All right, well, let's go ahead. Well, welcome to session two, which is our seismic um, uh, topics for today, Foundations for Extremes. So uh, we're going to Get right quick to the agenda for today. Uh, what we're going to talk about, something we didn't do last week, we're going to do a brief definition of helical anchors and piles. Sometimes people ask about that. We'll go through their advantages and disadvantages. Uh, key reasons, some of this is similar to what we talked about last week, those of you who were with us last week. Um, diversity, the right products. We'll talk a little bit about capacity uh, based upon building code um, requirements. Then we'll feature some shake table tests that were done at the University of California, San Diego a few years ago. We'll use that data then to describe for you how we look at lateral deflection of, and then capacity, lateral capacity analysis of helical anchors and piles uh, in soils, uh, and particularly when it comes to the seismic design categories D, E, and F, which is one of the new things that we've just recently been able to get uh, accomplished. Then Jeff, uh, Jeff Martin, my other fellow guest speaker, is going to talk about some case histories um, to kind of wrap up our end, and then a little bit again on some, some support and references that we've talked about before. So we'll get right to it with myself. Those of you who are with us last week, you have already seen this slide, so I won't spend a lot of time on it. You know, been with the company for a while, been actively involved in this type of industry for a long time. So. Uh, go quickly here to Jeff, and Jeff, if you are there, go ahead and just kind of introduce yourself, please. Hello, <clears throat> my name is Jeff Martin. Uh, I'm a civil engineer, and uh, I provide technical support for Pacific Helix, which is a, a chance civil construction distributor in the western United States. I've been with them for about 10 years now. All right, so... Um... Jeff will be uh, on again, like I say, later on, when we get into some of our case histories of actual projects in, uh, seismic, uh, in seismic areas. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time just actually defining what a helical anchor and a helical pile are. Uh, some people ask, uh, helical piles are factory manufactured products. So they're a steel foundation product. Often we refer to the term anchor uh, essentially the same as a pile, except the primary purpose is uh, usually just tension applications. Other names that people may use for these products are screw pile, helix pier, anchor, screw anchor, etc. So you may hear different terms when it comes to that or a helical foundation system. So essentially what they look like, and this is roughly to scale this picture on the left, uh, the flights here on the tip or the first section are the bearing elements, as we've talked about before. The last one, uh, we can also add helical extensions, plane extensions above that, and then connect it to some kind of a grade beam footing or some type of cap. So 
helical anchors and helical piles are screw found, you know, screw in elements, displacement elements, uh, and act in that way once they're installed. A couple of more comments about those. Uh, common components, we've talked about this a little bit last week. The central shaft, of course, is this portion, or likewise here, the, ex the extensions, plane and, and helicals with the helical plate on it, the couplings or the connections between each section. And you can see examples of that here. Um, we've talked about some of these others. The, the pitch is the actual distance between the leading and trailing edge of the helix plate itself. And then the pilot point is the tip. Uh, that's the below the first helix. That's the first part that enters into the ground. And so we just call that the pilot point for that particular uh, pile. Some advantages, torque correlation is one of the big advantages for helical anchors and piles. The equipment is usually relatively small. Um, one of the attributes that's not on this page is that they can be removed. And that in some cases is a, is a great application or a great app advantage. The, um, they can be used virtually anywhere as we talked about last week. Uh, no spoils because they're displacement elements. Uh, so if you want to look at some of the more important attributes, it's smaller equipment, poor correlation, immediate loading, and we'll talk more about those uh, when, once we get to the part relating to um, you know, why, why use them in what conditions. There are some disadvantages. There is no perfect deep foundation system. We thought we'd be fair to show them as well. Uh, they will not penetrate into solid, competent bedrock, uh, but they're not capable of that. They can refuse potentially in heavy cobble or heavy or boulder type of ground conditions. If you're in trash fill or concrete or debris, whatever, uh, they can be difficult, obviously, in those cases, as other deep foundations would be. Uh, buckling can limit the capacities of these types of piles in very soft soils. And lateral capacity may require augmentation because in, in some cases with slender elements, the lateral capacities aren't particularly high but that again is a function of the shaft diameter. And in some cases, uh, special, uh, building code requires special inspection for these types of products. So when it comes to the sizes and uh, different types of helical piles, we typically uh, lump them into three categories from a low displacement, medium, and then large. So you can see that the OD and how that varies uh, with sizes. So anything less than four and a half inch or less, we consider those a low displacement helical pile, mediums are less than eight, and then large or greater than eight inch. And these are for the shaft diameters. It's not uncommon in some cases for the plates to, you know, the uh, they'll range from up to 24 inches, common to, would be 12 to 14 is not unusual, sometimes smaller. And if you look at these, you get some ideas of capacities for the low, medium, and large displacement type helical piles. We're gonna spend most of our time talking about the low displacement because they're typically the more versatile and more common uh, in, the, in, the, in the industry. So we saw this one last week, but it's very good to repeat the key reasons why we use helical piles, uh, limited air disruption, again, no spoils, relatively low vibration or impact because you're just screwing them into the ground. Uh, ideal and restricted access sites like the one you see on the photograph that we showed you last week. Uh, the torque correlation is excellent for being able to validate uh, capacity in, in the field. A relatively low cost per KIP relationships, immediate loading, and then very scalable as we'll show you as we you know, talked about last week from one uh, type of product to the next. And again, I showed this slide last week, but it's worth repeating from our square shafts all the way up to a nine and five eighths inch OD pipe shaft helical pile. And again, the ones marked with the yeses here are those that are evaluated in our building code evaluation. And we will particularly talk about the four and a half inch today, the three and a half inch and these two and seven eighths, both the 203 wall and the 276 wall, because we're gonna be describing their seismic lateral capacities in, in, a, in a short minute here getting into more details about those products, which are in the building code evaluation. And now with um, uh, seismic design categories, D, E, and F added to their uh, capabilities. 
So from a selecting of the right products, again, we talked about this. Here's the building code evaluation, ESR 2794. Just somewhat repeat what it's used for, new construction, foundation repair. And again, I just mentioned that it's now been evaluated for seismic design categories. Uh, Chance does have the most in the industry when it comes to products evaluated. And as I mentioned, we're going to talk more about the three and a half, the four and a half, and these uh, two and seven eighths. Uh, pipe shafts. This is available uh, on our on our website, um, as well as from the ICC Evaluation Services uh, website as well, just simply by searching for 2794. Biobarica, worth mentioning again that if it is important for you on your projects that your that your the materials being used are by America or by American compliant, Hubble Chance can certainly assist you by sourcing the materials that comply with these requirements. And there are several federal mandates when it comes to Buy America or Buy American programs. So just let us know uh, if that's an issue, that's something that you have to deal with on your particular project. A few pictures here of examples of installation process, a wide variety of equipment. You can see some of the examples of the smaller equipment that's, that is not uncommonly used with helical. Uh, pile installation. Uh, you can see them being used on a flat uh, flat area probably to support a uh, reinforced slab. Here they're being used for uh, grade beams. Here's some interior applications at slight angles. And here's another example of uh, being installed for a short elevated type structure. Uh, you attach extensions as necessary to extend the pile to whatever uh, depths or lengths are required. A few more pictures. The hydraulic motors that you see here are what provides that torque energy to screw or rotate these helical piles into the ground. Uh, and again, you can see the variety of pieces of equipment that those hydraulic motors can be mounted to. So when it comes to capacity, this section 1810.3319, which is in the International Building Code, IBC, uh, up to the current uh, additions mentions these three methods for helical tiles for capacity. And this is basically the third, the first method is theoretical based on bearing capacity in, in the soil or rock. Method two is actually the torque correlation method that we've mentioned. I'll go into a little more detail here in a second. Uh, Well-documented correlations with torque is a very important aspect of torque correlation. And of course, you can always do a, a load test to determine capacity in soil. And these three items, of course, are the geotechnical capacities, uh, whereas you also have to look and make sure that your allowable strengths are appropriately selected for your helical anchors and piles so that you make sure that you don't overstress your the actual materials. Torque correlation, that method two I mentioned, is a very straightforward method. If you measure torque, you can predict the capacity based on this factor we call the torque factor or the case of T value. And it basically says that if you um, have a particular type of shaft size or, or displacement of materials, that torque factor that can be used, these are all pre-qualified torque factors based upon the uh, acceptance criteria that's used to evaluate helical anchors and piles, which is what leads to those uh, building code evaluation reports. So very important to know that Chance has been able to evaluate um, you know, all the basically on based on these pre-qualified uh, values here. So I want to get into uh, you know the meat and potatoes of our discussion today when it comes to lateral capacity, particularly in seismic conditions. And so I wanted to feature this work that was uh, led by Dr. Amy Serrato. She is a professor at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, she, along with several members of the basically helical pile industry, including Hubble Chan, sponsored. Uh, some lateral load testing way back in, I think, 2017 or 2018. I don't remember for sure the date. Uh, so we collaborated together as an industry, uh, uh, donated a lot of money and materials to get onto the shake table at the University of California, San Diego. So we had a great opportunity, narrow window of time to do it. So we responded quickly and got out there and led by Amy, did some some pretty excellent research, which I'm going to show you now a quick video uh, that kind of summarizes some of what happened and it's important for us to have because it leads to uh, 
Uh, let's see if I can figure out how to There we go. A helical pile researcher from the University of Oklahoma has come to the University of California, San Diego to test these questions on the largest outdoor shake table in the world. Well, we are standing on the world's largest outdoor shake facility. The table has a 40 million pound payload. And as you can see, we have the laminar soil box on the table, on the platen. And it is 15 feet tall by 22 feet long by 10 feet wide. And so we have 10 helical piles that we installed. And we're going to test them seismically to see how they react to earthquake loads. And right now the crew is loading on the inertial weights, which will simulate a building load on top of each pile. Several pile manufacturing companies donated materials to the project. And installer and manufacturer Torque Seal Foundations traveled to the site to perform the installation in a soil box mounted on the table. Piles of several types and sizes were tested, including round and square members, plus a push pile to compare with the helical piles to measure the shaking forces and resultant deformation of the test subjects. The team fitted accelerometers and strain gauges to the test members. To simulate independent axial loads on the pile members, on-site contractor, Torque Seal, bolted cylindrical concrete weights onto each pile. During a later test, a sand skid was used to simulate a building supported by a group of piles. The test included a simulation of the 1994 Northridge earthquake and the 1995 Great Hanshin, also known as the Kobe earthquake in Japan. Oops. Both sorry. <laughs> caused extreme damage to structures due to very high acceleration forces at the surface. Three, I think it went very well. It performed exactly like we thought it would in the analysis. You know, everyone was telling me that all the weights were going to bang together and everything was going to shear off, but our analysis said that the helical piles were, were going to behave a specific way. And thankfully, everything went as we planned. Uh, there was a lot of displacement of the soil around the piles, but that's exactly what you would expect to happen in the real world. And this test is actually a good one to show that we even though we hit the piles with a 6.9 earthquake, we came back and hit it again with a, an even bigger earthquake. So for aftershock effects, these helical piles held up very well. So pretty much it took seven earthquakes today and nothing failed. So we're, we're very pleased with the results. Okay, so that was uh, the video. Hopefully that was something that, that uh, you could see well enough. Um, so some of the outtakes of that, that you mentioned, she's mentioned there were different shapes. They had round and square. Uh, she didn't see any clear advantage of the geometry, at least not in these tests. The couplings were well below the grade. Um, they they didn't see that it had much effect. Um, you can read that here. The effect of the helix. Uh, they they didn't. Again, it wasn't really the intent of this of this particular study. But they didn't. You know, they said at this type, it's it's inconclusive. So um, we'll go to the next. Again, there's always the ability to more tests. They did find that piles in a group. Uh, take the load much more effectively and they deflect less and that kind of makes intuitive sense. Uh, this, the seismic group head displacement can be approximated with L-Pile or other software and we'll show you that in a minute. Um, and so that's we, we take advantage of some of that for some of our analysis that we've done. They notice the connection of the pile head is very important uh, dealing with either pinned or fixed in conditions. Pin connections are a little bit higher dampening ratios as you might expect with lower stiffness. 
So we use this data that Amy had plus our own work that's been done in our building code evaluations uh, to come up with a model to determine you know, the lateral load response of helical piles in, in the seismic design category. So we used uh, load test data from third party uh, that did actual lateral load tests on all these helical piles that we're talking about. We use that data to come up with a model, uh, you know, lateral load capacity model, soil model, and then we used a software program called AllPile to do the lateral load tests so that we could come up and try to simulate what we actually did in the field here by the third party and then extrapolate that information to then say, well, what would it do in a seismic category? Uh, we looked at uh, stiff, firm, and soft soils. And then we, again, we checked the, the two and seven eighths, three and a half, and the four inch, four and a half inch diameter pipe shafts that are currently listed in our evaluation report for both uh, lateral capacity and seismic and non-seismic conditions, both lateral capacity and deflection. So that's what we're going to talk about now. So here's um, you know, a, a sketch basically of what we looked at and what you probably saw in that video. Uh, the, the pile taking a deflected shape back and forth as you saw it move. And so uh, we're looking at um, the, uh, the Y sub T or the delta is that lateral drift of the pile head. This H value is the, the actual length from the pile head to the ground line. And that, that's important when you look at that annulus that formed in the, in the actual testing. Uh, this D sub O is the depth along the shaft to the point of zero deflection point at, or the flexural pile length. And then this uh, S sub T value is the depth down to the point of zero slope. So, and then the uh, L is the overall pile length. So these numbers or th these um, variables are important when it comes to when we did our actual analysis. And so that H value, when we come to the seismic uh, categories is that depth to that annulus, if you will, that you saw formed uh, uh, during the actual load test. And then the piece of H of course is the lateral capacity. So as I mentioned, we created models uh, where we develop the soils, the different soils, soft, stiff, um, and then hard, you know, firm clays. So, uh, you know, just showing you one example, the output from the from all pile, and then some load deflection response curves, both deflection moment, shear values. Uh, and so we use these actual uh, deflected curves to then come up with the allowable capacities, you know, for our various products. So. The first one we'll show you is the, the four and a half inch. Uh, and one of the things that I should have mentioned um, back here, we compared all of these, um, when we did all these, we compared these to the allowable drift uh, based upon ASE 7, which I'll show you in a minute, in terms of how much actual movement uh, that your structure can support, depending upon the type of structure it is. So we looked at the four and a half inch first, in terms of a shaft size, uh, it's turned sideways, but it's the, the pipe, the four and a half inch diameter uh, pile. And this is a compilation of all that data on those, um, those lateral analysis, both the, uh, the uh, seismic design categories, A, B, and C, uh, actual data, and then also some of the extrapolated data. So if you look here in stiff, firm, and soft soils, the lateral capacities, these are allowable. So that allowable typically is defined where the, the, the lateral displacement at the ground line is, is half of an inch or less. And so you can see that we're not breaking records with lateral capacity, but again, it's a four and a half inch diameter uh, OD, you know, pipe shaft. So depending on how the, the consistency or strength of the soils, of course, will de determine lateral strength. And again, this is that the, 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 the flexural length uh, the side, the, the, and the these numbers here, and then if we move over here to this side of the of the um, table for seismic design categories D, E, and F, we determine the H value, that annulus depth, based upon the fact that the seismic or the shaft seismic flexural length per the AC 358 requirement is 120% of the shaft flexural length of that D sub O, and so we have that annulus that forms at the surface creates the longer lengths for D sub O, likewise the longer lengths for that point of zero slope. And also pay attention to this allowable story drift at the pile head. So these, um, these factors, which are a function of, of H, which is 
um, the h value is the um, the story height, if you will. So we're looking at saying, well, how much can this pile move back and forth before it's not appropriate for a particular structure type? And so this is a reprint of Table 12.12.1 from ASCE 7. And you get they basically define these four different structure types. Uh, number one is a non-masonry shear walls, four stories or less. Then you have masonry cantilever walls, other masonry walls, shear walls, and then all other. So it's not real, you know, it's lumped together type. You know, obviously the most, the tightest criterion when it comes to story drift or allowable drift are these two here, because they have the, you can see the, the actual values are pretty low compared to some of these other non-masonry uh, shear wall structures. And so we're comparing the actual values from our analysis here with what ASCE 7.12.12.1 tells us. And it's based on risk category. So risk category has to do with occupancy. Uh, low risk is, uh, is one up to pretty high risk of life critical structures, which is four. So you know, kind of the recap the, for, the, for the four and a half inch piles, um, again, you can see the lateral capacities are the same, uh, but if I go back to this, notice that the, the flexion, displacement at the pile head is, you know, getting close to an inch. And so when you look at that, it basically tells you that if you're in very stiff soils, you can use these piles in that first category, um, structures other than masonry shear walls, four stories or less, et cetera. Um, and they can also be used in the um, all other structures, which was that you know, category, the last category you know, based upon that ratio. So uh, it, that ratio, that drift must be less than or equal to the allowable drift in order for it to be used in those categories. So it could be used here in all risk categories and also here simply based upon the numbers that you see. So you can do the same thing for firm and soft and you can see how um, for firm soils, it can be used, you know, again, um, all other structures other than the masonry shear wall structures, et cetera. And so this is how you can determine whether or not you can use them. Notice that the soft soils can be used in all risk categories. Um, the, the difference is of course, with the soft soils, you're not gonna have a lot of lateral capacity. So, uh, you know, you can be used in all of them, but your capacities are not gonna be that great. So you may have to obviously have other means of resisting lateral capacities. So the next set of slides are much the same as what you just saw. Excuse me, except that this is the different shaft sizes. So now we're looking at the three and a half inch and the same table. So notice that our values are lower because the shaft size is, is smaller, but it's the same criterion. We're looking at the allowables at about five, you know, half inch deflection and then how that changes when we add in that annulus at the top so it lengthens the pile and uh, the corresponding you know, drift ratios over here. And so again, the same table as we saw before. Um, and now you see how, again, the three and a half can still be used in, in the first uh, category structures other than masonry walls. Uh, and then in categories one through three in, the all, in all other structures. In other words, it can't be used in category four, which was the case with the four and a halves. Um, and again, you can see the same kind of trend here. Um, you know, you, 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 a little bit better here in all, all categories for the uh, infirm soils when it comes to, uh, you know, the, the two criterion that is the tightest, these two here, again, you're not able to uh, use them in those situations, again, because of the ratios. Um, but again, that just shows you the effects of the different shaft sizes. When we go to the two and two and seven eighths, uh, you can see again much the same thing. Again, the loads are lower, the lateral capacities, and notice that when you get into seismic design categories D, E, and F, the two and seven eighths is basically hey you can't use it uh, in those soft soil conditions. Too much movement, too much deflection. So again, you can see how it does limit based on shaft diameter, which is intuitive. You would think that because the shafts are not large. So again, not a, not a not applicable here in soft, and again, other the structures than the other masonry wall structures, four stories or less, is too much of a mouthful to say every time. And then the risk categories one through three and the all others. 
with these allowable lateral capacities. And then one more, uh, again, another two and seven eighths, but this is a thicker wall, so it's gonna have a stiffer response. And so you can see where, yeah, now you're able to develop some lateral capacities, again, relatively low in soft soils, but it's still there. And you can see the same effect in the stiff and the firm soils and go through the same um, assessment of in what structures or, or risk categories or occupancy categories it can be used. So all this information is, going to, is available and will be available in our technical manuals so that now you can easily look at what kind of allowable lateral capacities and various soil types these piles can be subjected to and structure types um, in a seismic uh, event. So kind of going through that quick, but I wanted to make sure we, we covered all that. And so we're going to now transition into some case histories. I'll do one uh, real quick one, and then um, um, Jeff is gonna take over and do a couple of more. So this one is from a you know fairly recent earthquake that occurred in hit Anchorage, Alaska, back in the, the November of 2018 of 7.1 magnitude. A tremendous amount of displacement uh, occurred um, in a lot of the areas uh, during this um, earthquake. And we particularly looking at this project where residents settled about 20 inches, which I think is remarkable that it has settled with that much as a result of this earthquake. It said it occurred due to liquefaction of loose sands and the drainage of the of peat layers below this structure. Uh, the helical pile contractor used two and seven eighths inch piles, 34 of them to underpin the structure. And they went ahead and restored this structure back. They lifted it 20 inches uh, in order to do that uh, project. So uh, quite a remarkable job. You can see they had some relatively loose sands at the surface, which is what probably liquefied, but notice uh, they had a lot of peat here. Or in this, in this one, they had some peat, but in the second boring, they had some fairly significant depth of peat, which dewatered you know, during the seismic event, which is what probably led to such a dramatic uh, amount of settlement. Here are some examples of the actual work. Uh, these are the helical piles that have already been installed, the foundation repair brackets mounted, and then you can see the hydraulic uh, jacks being used to actually do the lift. And these thread bars are, are required so that they can accommodate that 20 inch lift. Uh, a little bit closer picture of the same thing. And then here they used uh, some flowable fill materials uh, to fill some of the gaps after after they had um, had done the work. So that's a quick example of one use of helicals in the case of restoring a a structure that had settled a lot. <laughs> so we're going to transition now to uh, Jeff, and he's going to give you a couple of examples in in the California area. And Jeff, let me uh, I got to. Um, well, let's see, I gotta figure out how to do this. I gotta give you uh, the, um, I think I will have just given you control of the bow. So I think you can go ahead and, and drive. Okay. So this uh, first example is uh, an asphalt plant that was constructed in Santa Rosa, California in 2013, I believe. Um, you need me to advance or can you do it? I am not able to advance for some reason, Gary. All right. Just let me know. Okay. <clears throat> the, uh, the project was to construct three uh, new asphalt batching silos. These structures were 85 feet tall. So obviously they had some some fairly high gravity loads and overturning forces associated with them. The uh, the original foundation was designed as a, a 40 by 60 foot mat slab. It was originally designed to be five and a half feet thick. Eric, can you go to the next slide? However, uh, the soils on site, and this is the boring log from the soils report, uh, was an alluvial fan location, uh, had interbedded soft to stiff clays and loose to very dense grants and savils, or 
gravels and sands, excuse me. <laughs> ground, groundwater at 10 feet. Um, it's in an area of strong seismic activity. There were some thin liquefiable layers at around seven and 15 feet that were subject to densification. And they were anticipating differential settlements of as much as three to five inches across the, the footprint of the slab. You go to the next slide, Gary. So we looked at, oh dear, um, there's gonna be a lot of this, Gary. So we looked at uh, the map slab and the, the settlement there was, was too much, that was rejected. Uh, this was in a residential neighborhood, is surrounded by residential neighborhoods, and so uh, driven piles were rejected due to noise and vibration. Uh, drilled casts in place shafts, the, the high water table, the potential for caving, and the need to, to case that caused us to reject that. So we ended up going with helical piles that helped us deal with those variable conditions and eliminated the off haul of, of spoils. Go ahead and go to the next slide. The, uh, the helical pile elements uh, incorporated 144 chance SS-175 solid bar square shaft piles. Those are an inch and three quarter uh, square shaft. They were installed to a, a minimum torque of 8,500 foot pounds, which gave them uh, an allowable ASD capacity of 42 kips per pile. The lead sections, uh, originally we started out with three helixes on, on each lead. In some cases where we weren't achieving the minimum required torque, we added uh, 14 inch followers to those lead sections. So some of these had as many as five helices. Uh, they achieved torque at depths ranging between 35 and 85 feet. Uh, all of that variation taking place across a, a 40 by 60 foot. Uh, footprint. <clears throat> go ahead and go to the, the next slide, Gary. The lateral capacity uh, was provided by these battered piles out here. Somebody had asked a question earlier about the, the proper angle uh, to install battered piles at, and it depends on a number of factors, one of which is how quickly you get down to competent bearing strat down here. In this case, there was a, a geometric consideration. Uh, the superstructure was designed with these outriggers on it. And so uh, that kind of uh, dictated the batter angle, um, but uh, you, you then look at the, the capacity that you need and it uh, leads to the choice of, of how many uh, battered anchors that you need to, to carry those lateral forces. Go ahead to the next slide, Gary. So, and, the uh, redesign of this foundation I mentioned before it was originally designed as a five and a half foot thick mat slab uh, in order to offset some of the cost of the deep foundation elements uh, I reduced the thickness of that slab to two feet uh, which necessitated using some some fairly substantial primary reinforcement in the concrete this was designed as a waffle slab. So these are the our back to back channels that the pot helical piles here are terminating in. The anchor rods came down and were bolted off to these uh, primary reinforcement. These are uh, longitudinal grade beams that tie the whole thing together. <clears throat> and then we used uh, geofoam to create the, the voids in the waffle slab. Can you go to the next slide here? You can see here this under construction. This is a uh, low density geofoam uh, that was used there. <laughs> Getting ready to pour. Go ahead to the next slide. This is a picture of the completed project. This is the original on existing silo on the site. And these are the three new silos. Uh, this is an actual photograph that the job or the uh, plant foreman took with his iPhone one night catching this and they very nicely landscaped by the way. Uh, the interesting thing is this uh, site experienced a 6.0 earthquake just about six months after the project was completed. Uh, I contacted the owners uh, after that event and they had 
quite a bit of ground motion at the site uh, that they captured on security cameras, but there there was no damage to the foundation, no visible damage to the, the area around that pad at all. <clears throat> Go ahead to the next slide, Gary. This next case history is for a cooling tower that was constructed in uh, Richmond, California. Go ahead to the next slide. Uh, it was uh, on the waterfront in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, incorporated 17 vertical helical piles. There's a mistake in this slide, actually, and then 38 battered helical piles for lateral capacity. Um, go ahead to the, the next slide, Gary. I think I've got most of this information. This is a uh, just a diagram of what the uh, cooling tower looked like. You can see it was 34 feet tall and included some additional uh, mechanical equipment. Go ahead to the next slide. The original conceptual design was for a, a 41 foot wide by 49 foot long mat slab. And one of the original geotechnical recommendations was that it could be supported on compacted aggregate piers, which you see here. Uh, alternates to those compacted ag whoops sorry Gary uh, alternates to those piers included drilled piers driven piles and helical piles so those were all considered okay go ahead the soils on site uh, had some fill to depths of about oh seven to ten feet up here <clears throat> below that fill was uh, bay mud extending down to around 17 feet so this is the material that we were obviously concerned about. Uh, below that was some silty sand and clay, and then down and beginning around 35 feet, there was a, a layer of denser uh, sand and, and granular material. And so this is the area that we were targeting to try and, and embed those lead sections into and develop our capacity. Go ahead to the, the next slide, Gary. The active aggregate piers uh, would have, and again, this site also had a high water table. Uh, so the compacted aggregate piers uh, would have required off-hauling and spoils. Uh, and there, the design of uplift resistance systems uh, complicated the construction of those compacted aggregate piers and, and made the cost less attractive than it otherwise would have been. Uh, drilled cast and place shafts were basically uh, rejected for the same reason. So we've designed this with helical piles. Uh, the addition of some extra mechanical equipment uh, eventually necessitated changing the footprint of this foundation. So you can see it turned into a, an L-shaped pad mat slab. Uh, the vertical helical piles are are located here. They're you know effectively on a there's three wide across here in these locations that you can see, and then there's some additional verticals out here on this corner. The battered piles, due to the the shape, were um, a little bit tricky to get them all in uh, without having conflicts, geometric conflicts between the vertical piles and the battered piles. But I came up with a layout that worked. Uh, the uh, again the the vertical piles uh, for gravity loads were designed to develop 96 kips ultimate capacity per pile with a, an ASD allowable capacity then of 48 kips. Go ahead to the next slide, Gary. So because I was trying to develop that capacity in that that roughly eight to ten foot thick zone of of denser material wanted to stay with a, a small number of helices. So I used a, a twin helix lead section with one 10 inch and one 12 inch helix. And you can see here, this is a, a helicap report that we use to estimate the predicted capacity of these piles uh, based on the soil profile from the soils report. The ultimate capacity was 94 kips uh, for this one. And the battered piles, uh, they were installed at 45 degrees to the horizontal. They were in, uh, intended only to carry lateral loads. Uh, and in order to get uh, enough capacity, both in compression and in tension, used a, a 12 and a 14 inch helix uh, with a predicted tensile capacity of 79 kips ultimate, so uh, just about 40 kips allowable. 
These piles were designed as combination piles uh, in order to, to have better buckling capacity in that bay mud material that was near the surface. So the bottom end of these combination piles use a, an SS200 solid square shaft lead uh, for the bottom 21 feet, transitioning to a three and a half inch hollow stem uh, section at the top. And then these for a minimum uh, pipe and section of 21 feet in length, uh, actually these transitions are happening at a, at a minimum of 21 feet below grade. So in the case of these battered piles that were installed at 45 degrees, this length is a minimum of 28 feet and the, the square shaft section length down here was 28 feet as well. Uh, again, these were designed to develop 80 kips ultimate and 40 kips allowable, uh, which dictated the, the number that needed to be installed. Let me go ahead to the next slide from here. So one of the things that I, I wanted to point out about that is because those battered piles were designed to operate both in compression and in tension, in a reversible load regime. Uh, one of the things that you have to be certain of is that the, the uh, pressure bulb that develops around that lead section is in competent material as opposed to in that bay mud. So you can see in compression that, that these, uh, the impact is felt on the beneath the plates of the lead section. Go ahead and, and bump that slide, Gary. But in tension, that pressure bulb is on the is above the lead section, and so you need to make sure that you have adequate overburden of competent material for that that pressure bulb to develop. Go ahead to the next slide, Gary. Keep going. The other thing I wanted to point out is that the the uh, combo pile I used in order to to uh, prevent buckling of that shaft in that bay mud. Uh, but I, I wanted to point out that as slender as these elements are, uh, they it doesn't take a lot of uh, lateral restraint from the soil column in order to prevent them from buckling and to force them to carry the, the loads in an axial fashion down to the lead section. So this is a, a slide from a, a AISC load test that was done to determine how much lateral force is required at the midpoint of a, a half sine wave column in order to force it from mode one buckling into mode two buckling where you develop a full sine wave. Uh, and that drives P critical from uh, P critical to four times P critical based on a single bracing point. That uh, lateral load that's required to, to force that uh, column to buckle in a full sine wave is just about 1% of P critical. So you can imagine how little restraint is really required from the soil. The rule of thumb that we use in design for these things is that a solid square shaft, which is quite slender, will not buckle in soil that has SPT blow counts of, of five or more. So the, those hollow shaft sections are really only required where buckling is a concern in, in very, very soft soil. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is that um, we do perform buckling analysis for those cases. Uh, I always consult with a geotechnical engineer about what kind of an unbraced length I need to be considering. But if I've got adequate embedment of that lead section, uh, at the top and in, in the case of new construction where that bracket at the top is embedded in fresh concrete, I'm generally assuming that that's a, a fully fixed condition uh, or perhaps a, a condition like this where you've got potentially drift at the top. But the other point that I wanted to make is that, you know, Gary covered the allowable lateral capacity of, of these vertically installed tiles, uh, but when that capacity as low as it is on the order of one to three kips for a, a vertically installed pile is insufficient. That doesn't mean that you can't carry gravity loads on these piles. It just means that you have to find another load path for those lateral forces to, to uh, be taken out in. And the use of battered piles is a very effective way to do that.
And I think I'm done, Gary. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Well, we'll kind of recap a little bit now in the time we have left. Uh, some of this, again, is, is what you've seen last week. So uh, uh, bear with us again. There is a lot of tools for you available. Our Hubble TV video channel will give you a lot of information, particularly the Helicap software. Jeff mentioned using that. There are video tutorials on the Hubble TV site that allows you to, teaches you how to use the software. Uh, the page is hubbletv.com, so certainly go visit that. Lots of other information there as well. Um, technical design manual, I mentioned this earlier. Uh, this is available to you, edition four. Uh, the, um, we'll be updating it soon in order to, up, you know, always updating tech manuals, adding additional products and the additional capacities with the um, addition of the seismic design category. So this is also available uh, to you at this link on our website as well. And somebody might be able to either chat or put this in the Q&A later on as to have that particular uh, link available since it's too busy to remember. <laughs> um, the software, mentioned Helicap. This is the landing page for the Helicap software, hpsapps.com forward slash Helicap. Uh, this is the project that, or the product that we use every day for designing helical anchors and piles both vertical, battered, you name it, different um, configurations of these, of these products. It's a design tool available to you. All you gotta do is create an account and you can start using it. Uh, mention this again, uh, there's a lot of support from us, from our team, uh, whenever, if and whenever we can actually get together again in, in the real world. So we're hoping for that someday. Uh, testing services I mentioned as well. And again, just as a somewhat of a repeat here about chance, uh, experience, the tools that we have, um, we offer a wide variety of products, uh, both for the helical piles and anchors, and also uh, we manufacture uh, different tools that are used to install all these products. Uh, I'll kind of end with perhaps some additional information that we didn't talk about last week. The building codes that have helical piles included in them, I referenced the IBC, the International Building Code, uh, Chapter 18 specifically, Deep Foundations. Uh, the CBC uh, mentions them and these uh, different cities mention the helical piles, the New York City Building Code, City of Chicago, which we've recently uh, added a supplement for the City of Chicago into our ESR report. So I would encourage you to look at that. It's towards the very end of our ESR report. It's a supplement. And there's other international codes, Australia, New Zealand standards as well. Some design guides that are out there. Uh, this is one from New Zealand. Uh, IPINS Engineers New Zealand Practice Note 28. Um, they refer to them as screw piles. The brand, uh, I should say brand new, nearly new back in um, Early 2020, the Helical Pile Foundation Design Guide uh, that was prepared by the Deep Foundations Institute is actually uh, 2019, the fall is when it was ready. And of course, the Canadian Foundation Engineering Manual, which has been out there for quite some time, uh, has also gives good references for helical piles. And there's a few books out there uh, that you might be of interest. Uh, Perko's book has been out for a while, a good practical guide for helical uh, piles. So. With that, I think we are done. Do we have any questions that have come in that we can try to answer? This would be the time to do it. Thank you, Gary and Jeff. For the next few minutes, today's speakers will respond to some of the questions submitted during the presentation. Please continue to submit questions using the questions tab on the control panel. The first question. What software programs can be used to conduct lateral capacity analysis on helical piles? Uh, basically, there's no limit to that. As long as you can develop the model for the software, we use, um, we use LPile uh, quite extensively. I showed you the also LPile from Civil Tech. That's also a very appropriate. Uh, and I'm sure there are other lateral you know, analysis programs out there that are also effectively used with helical piles. We also use Group, which is another product from NSOFT for, for uh, pile groups. So if you have um, more than one single helical pile you're wanting to look at in ter terms of an overall group effect, 
uh, the group software is very effective. Again, we use that all the time as well. All right, next question. What three Chance brand pipe shaft OD helical piles products have been evaluated for seismic design categories D, E, and F? Good question. And it's, um, we started out, we evaluated the four and a half inch, so four and a half inch OD helical pile. And we have just recently submitted for three and a half inch OD helical piles. And then we've submitted for two of our two and seven eighths product families. Uh, they have um, both their Schedule 40 and a Schedule 80 pipe wall thickness. So we refer to them as a 203 wall. That's the Schedule 40. And then there's also the Schedule 80 or, or 276 wall um, product. So those have all been evaluated for uh, seismic design categories D, E, and F. Awesome. The third question. Can battered piles be used to provide lateral restraint? Jeff, you want to kind of cover that one? Yes, they can, uh, and I've done it frequently. Uh, the the analogy, uh, if you they're frequently used as tiebacks for retaining walls, uh, and it's a very similar application to use them uh, to provide lateral restraint to foundation. Awesome. Moving on. So the fourth question, where will you see the most stress along the pile shaft during a seismic event? <laughs> That's a good question. You want to try that one, Jeff? No, I was hoping that you would, would do that <laughs> one. <laughs> um, well, I mean, just I, if we... I, if, Go ahead. I thought your I thought your slide showing the deflected shapes uh, back there in the middle of the deck was would provide some pretty good hints. Yeah, I mean, if you look at you know, just some of our monotonic analysis of it, uh, it's going to happen you know up at up at the top near the near the surface. Uh, that's likely where you're going to get that because at that time you're you're mobilizing lateral capacity, that shear resistance, but you're also mobilizing moment resistance in the soils and so that pile has to transfer those loads into the soil and so it's you're going to be carrying shear moment and axial forces in in the pile shaft so it, you're, it's very likely the higher stresses are occurring at or near the surface and you know the finite element analysis that we've done in you know in some cases you know just looking at you know pile response in some of these programs that we look at like group analysis it'll demonstrate that it'll it'll show you where the higher stresses are, and, it, and it's at or near the surface. It, it also depends on end condition, as we've talked about as well. So. Awesome. Next question. So per ASCE 7-16-12.13.7.2, foundation ties for individual pile caps is required. Do you think using helical battered piles can substitute the code need for using tie requirements? Yeah, that's a mouthful. Uh, I'm not sure I am able to answer that one right at this moment. So we can certainly look into it. And unless Jeff, you are, uh, if you know off the top of your head, if that's true or not. Uh, Gary, I don't. Um, I, I mean, I've had success, you know, permitting those projects. Um, the uh, I, I, I need. I'd have to think about that question some more. Um, can you read it back again? Yes, I can. So, per ASCE seven dash sixteen twelve point thirteen point seven point two. Foundation ties for individual pile caps are required. Do you think using helical battered piles can substitute the code need for using ties requirements? Unfortunately, I don't think I'm prepared to answer that question right now. I'd have to go back and read that code section and make sure I understand exactly what they're asking. We can move on to one final question. 
What factor of safety is typically used to determine a liable compression and tension capacity when only measuring tor torque during installation? Well, the, the industry standard typically in that condition is, is a, a minimum of two. In some situations, we have some people advocating for a little bit higher, like two and a half. Uh, a lot of it depends on how much soil can, you know, how much information you know about your soil. So if, if you're bereft of any soil data, you know, you may want to consider using a factor of safety a little more than two, uh, maybe two and a half. Um, the, the standard most of the time in most situations that, that for determining allowables is a factor of safety of two. Now, again, that's for axial loads. For lateral, we look at it a little bit differently and you know, we're looking at it more based upon the allowable displacement. So that's, that's something to keep in mind as well. So we, typically we try to limit the allowable, the loads is what's going to result in a deflection of a half of an inch or less when it comes to lateral, if that, hopefully that makes sense. And then again, you saw the tables that in a seismic event, you're going to see more movement than that. Uh, but again, within the confines of the allowable drift that we showed you. Awesome. And that concludes the question section. Thank you, Gary and Jeff. As we finish, please make sure to download your certificate of completion from the handouts tab in the control panel. You have to add your name to the certificate when downloaded. If you missed our note at the beginning and you are watching the live webinar with the group on one person's computer, please download the multiple viewer registration form, which is also under the handouts tab. We need this information in case you are audited and we are contacted to verify this continuing education activity. There will be screenshots of your control panel to help you navigate the